This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Spoiler alert, if you aren't caught up watching the HBO series Girls, we're about to talk about a scene from the fourth season. In this clip, a couple, Tad and Laureen, are leaving the therapy session. Uh, I feel there's something I want to share with you. You do? Yeah, I do. Uh, I've been thinking lately that I'm, um, I'm gay. What? And not lately, actually, for a while. <laughs> Shut up, Dad. What is this, one of your stupid pranks? No, it's not. Lorene, you have to listen to me. I think I'm gay. You think? No, I am. I don't think I am. No, you're not. Why are you saying that? Oh, please, you're not gay. I think it would have come up. It is coming up right now. I'm serious. This is ridiculous. We were in therapy two seconds ago. You weren't gay in there. Yes, I was. I just didn't want to share it with her. That is who you're supposed to be sharing it with, our therapist who we pay. Yeah, I just couldn't do it. I don't trust her. That's a clip from the HBO series Girls, and it goes along with our show today. Adults, like the character Tad, who come out as gay well into adulthood. Later, we'll hear from Connecticut residents, two men and a woman who came out later in life, after being married to heterosexual partners and having children. You might be wondering, how does that happen? Our next guest can explain. Dr. Lauren Olson is a psychiatrist from the Midwest. He was married to a woman and has children. At 40, he came out of the closet. Dr. Olson weaves his personal story and explains the psychology behind why people come out late in life in his book, Finally Out, Letting Go of Living Straight. Dr. Olson joins us from the studios of WABE in Atlanta. Dr. Olson, welcome to where we live. Thank you very much for having me. I understand you're a psychiatrist. Your book is pretty personal. Tell us about your childhood. Well, I grew up in uh, rural Nebraska uh, in a town of about a thousand. Uh, it was very much everybody was the same. We were all white. Uh, we were all Protestant and everybody looked alike and thought alike. And that was the world that I grew up uh, in until I was 18. And then I went to the University of Nebraska and it was all People from small towns like Wakefield, Nebraska, they, they were all uh, white. Uh, they were all uh, pretty much Protestant and thought alike and looked alike. And during this time, um, after um, school, you became a successful doctor. You married. You had children. But your life, everything changed at 40. Tell us what happened. <laughs> well, what happened was I uh, accidentally fall, fell in love with a man. Uh, he was uh, married. I was married. I thought, uh, what could possibly go wrong, you know? And, uh, of course, a lot went wrong at that point. Um, but I was kind of blown away by it because I had not expected it. I had not been sexually active with men um, during the earlier part. I was living uh, the life I thought uh, uh, was the dream life I had planned. I was married. I had a psychiatric practice. I'd been uh, had a successful career in the Navy. I had two children, and uh, that was uh, the life I had sacrificed for. You mentioned at that moment um, there was a, a, a man that you fell in love with, uh, and you said at 40 this happened. Before that, was there ever a time where you were thinking, you know, maybe um, this was your true sexual identity? Well, there were clues along the way. Uh, but, you know, anytime anything came up like that, I quickly put it out of my head uh, and had another explanation for it. Uh, um, but I, uh, I, looking back after, after sort of I had the enlightenment uh, about it, then I saw that there were certain evidences. Uh, but, you know, it was just, uh, for me, such a uh, powerful negative kind of ex uh, idea for me that I really dismissed it. And, you know, it's a, a psychological defense that we call denial, uh, where uh, things that are abhorrent to us are just uh, completely blocked from our conscious mind. And for the most part, that's the way it was. It's kind of like a child believing in Santa Claus. You hang on to that belief as long as you can, and suddenly you can't hang on to it any longer. How long were you in this relationship with this um, other individual, and when did your wife find out? Well, uh, we were, uh, uh, we, since he was married and I was married, we would meet uh, sort of uh, uh, whenever we could. Uh, and. Uh, we were together in that relationship for about two years. He was from South America. He was a student at Iowa State. Uh, and so, you know, there were boundaries around the relationship because he was going to have to go home, and I thought that would be the end of it for me. 
Uh, and uh, it was toward the end of that time uh, that she discovered uh, some stuff that I had written and confronted me about it, and I uh, confessed to it. But uh, when, I, when the relationship with him began, I really didn't think that it would lead to anything more than just sort of a temporary kind of fling. Mm. And so what, how was this, um, how did this impact your family? Well, of course, uh, they were upset. Uh, you know, I had, I had sort of been uh, considering it for a couple of years ahead of that time. Uh, and um, when I finally, we had this confrontation, uh, my wife actually wanted to stay married at that point. You know, the idea of divorce was not something that was uh, common in our life experience. And, of course, she was very fearful about uh, what life would be like for her uh, living alone. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the financial aspects. And, of course, you know, she was living the life that she was cut out to live, too, in the sense that uh, everything, all of her expectations were being met. So it disrupted everything uh, for both of us. and. Initially, of course, she felt uh, some sense that maybe it was her fault if she had been a better partner, a better lover, a better wife, that this wouldn't have happened. Uh, and then, of course, there was a sense of anger and betrayal that came with it, too. So there were uh, a lot of uh, feelings that uh, came out for her. And, and those began at the moment of the confrontation. I had been dealing with it before, and I was ready to fly and at a time when she was just very much beginning the struggle to deal with it. And your children, what was their reaction? Well, they were 9 and 13 at the time. Uh, they didn't know about it for a while, or I, I should say I, I don't know what they knew about it. Uh, my wife was very uh, good about not putting them in the middle of this or uh, trying to... Uh, use me in a way to separate me from them. And I, um, I'm eternally grateful for that because a lot of men have had different experiences from that. Uh, but when I uh, finally got to the point where I told them they were a couple years older than that, probably 11 and 15 or so, uh, and they said, uh, Dad, we already knew. Mm -hmm. uh, and they wouldn't tell me exactly how they knew. I think probably when they were spending their Wednesdays and weekends with me uh, in Des Moines, uh, that they had probably been exposed to um, some literature or something in my um, uh, apartment that uh, I'm not really sure even now how they knew. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. I'm speaking with Dr. Lauren Olson. He's a psychiatrist and author of Finally Out, Letting Go of Living Straight. In the book, he shares his personal story and talks about his research and why some individuals who um, decide to come out as gay uh, well into their adulthood, you know, what are the factors that, that cause that decision and that announcement to come later in life? If this is some familiar to you, if someone in your family has experienced this, you can join the conversations. Uh, Dr. Olson, uh, the time when your family found out and, and the, the, the later divorce, uh, this is a, a difficult time in, in anyone's life. But at the same time, was there also um, a feeling of, of freedom and this uh, this that this secret or the fact that you now acknowledge that you were gay was out in the open? Oh, yes. Uh, for me, of course, uh, uh, it, as I said, it was, it was different for me than it was for the rest of the family. But for me, it was like uh, puncturing an abscess. You know, all this pus uh, came running out from behind. And there, there was a release that you get when you have something building up inside of you that's painful. Uh, and... Uh, you know, there was this, uh, obviously, I was 40. I was entering a, a world that I didn't know. I uh, didn't know how to date somebody when I was uh, that age. Uh, and I had um, uh, fears about that. It was also at the height of the HIV AIDS crisis. And so I had uh, some fears and began to think, you know, what the hell have I done, you know, to uh, have made this decision at this particular time? But there's also just sort of this enormous sense of peace that finally uh, you're feeling uh, that uh, you have some moral integrity, that you're feeling wholehearted, that finally uh, everything has come to get, uh, together in a way that uh, is aligned. In your book, and this again, this book 
came out actually, I think, six or seven years ago. This is a new edition of Finally Out, uh, Letting Go of Living Straight. And you're fairly open in, in the beginning of the book, Dr. Olson, that you're often asked two questions when people hear your story. Um, there's disbelief that at 40 you didn't know that you were gay until you were 40 and that your marriage was a sham. How do you respond to that? Well, the second question uh, is easy to answer. It was never a sham. Uh, both uh, my wife and I would agree and uh, have talked about it many times before that you know, we entered the marriage uh, with the same commitment that other couples enter uh, in, in good faith with an expectation that our life uh, would be joined together forever. Uh, and that was our, the basis of our experience. And after I uh, had been, uh, when I'll, actually when I was doing the writing of the first edition, I, c- I called her up and I said, uh, I want to come talk to you about our sex life. Uh, and she said, oh, sure, you, know, you, uh, you bring the, the Chinese and I'll get the wine and we'll spend the evening talking about it. And my, my question to her was, you know, was there any sense for you that I wasn't totally present in that relationship? And her response was, absolutely not. You know, that, that uh, she thought, uh, as I did, that it was as good as it could get. And uh, so there was never any clue for her either that uh, I had this uh, sense of, uh, uh, I guess, difference or uneasiness about my sexuality. Um, Part of the story is that my father was killed in a tragic farm accident when I was three. And so any sort of atypical interests that I had that um, for a man, I, I always attribute it to not having a father around. And if my father had been there, he would have uh, uh, taught me how to be a man. And so I used that as kind of a cover, not knowing that I was using it as a cover, but it became kind of my go-to ex- uh, excuse for uh, anything that was not sort of traditionally or typically masculine. And when you decided to come out, you said you didn't know how to date. When you thought about writing this book, these experiences that you were having, I mean, how common is it for adults um, who, who they at some point feel comfortable um, admitting that their sexual identity is gay, how common is it for people to hold that in until they're in their adulthood? Because so often, you know, these days we hear so much about um, when we think about gay culture, um, the embracement of it and looking at young people who are open to becoming to coming out. But you're someone, again, who was married, had kids, and it was well into your uh, middle age where you decided, you know, I can be open about this and I can admit this. Well, uh, Lucy, that was kind of the motivation for writing the book originally because uh, when I began to be curious about this and try to understand myself, I went to the literature as a good physician would do and tried to discover what was written about uh, uh, coming out in midlife. And there really wasn't much out there at all. Uh, Everything talked about uh, the process of young people coming out and how you went through stages uh, one through six, and by 25 you were uh, uh, through the process and and comfortable with your sexuality. Well, I was probably 35 or close to 40 maybe when I was reading that, and I thought, well, I can't be gay because I'm not through this process yet. And then as I began to explore this more, I found more and more men like myself uh, who, uh, for a variety of different reasons, uh, didn't uh, discover their sexuality uh, and uh, until midlife, or in some cases, many people did know their sexuality and thought that a marriage would cure it, uh, and uh, that they would uh, finally be heterosexual. So many men have come, and women too, as I've talked to women more about it, uh, come to this realization uh, after a very long process of of thinking about it. You mentioned your medical background. Uh, We're talking about some of the um, factors um, in your upbringing, um, in your relationship. But as a psychiatrist in your book, you mention uh, the steel partition in your brain. Tell me about that. (laughs) Well, it was uh, like that everything uh, that was uh, related to the same-sex attraction was just completely sealed off uh, from my consciousness. I I think one of the most... uh, obvious examples of that was I was in St. Louis, and this was like uh, 
right before us to get married. I went there with my brother, and we were doing sort of a bachelor's night uh, away before the marriage. And I was in this antique store, and this uh, I was uh, 25 at the time, and this very attractive young man came up to me and started uh, talking with me and, and asking me some questions about myself. And as we were talking, uh, he reached out and he touched my crotch. And I thought, well, boy, is he clumsy. You know? And I kind of became uh, uncomfortable, but I moved away, and he was an interesting guy, so I, uh, he came and talked to me. Uh, and uh, he uh, touched me again, and uh, it wasn't until the third time that I really understood what was going on, and then I was just in a total panic. I was angry. I wanted to report him to the police. I felt very much uh, uh, that I had been uh, uh, invaded. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, part of it was uh, dealing with the, the sense that it was also very attractive to me in, in a way. Uh, uh, and at the same time thinking, here I am on the cusp of entering uh, a commitment uh, to a long-term marriage with my wife, and I have experienced this. So it was just so um, negative to me that I, again, patched it off uh, and ex uh, explained it away. And it wasn't until actually when I finally uh, came out that I began to say, well, I was given off some clues, you know, somehow without even knowing it. And when I met the man that I became involved with, I thought, well, how did he know? And uh, again, I think uh, the clues that I was giving off was that I was, I was observing more. I was paying more attention than probably uh, a truly heterosexual man would. And, and so I uh, was expressing an interest that I didn't even know that I was expressing. And they were responding to that uh, uh, information. Before we head to break, Dr. Olson, I had um, asked earlier about um, uh, the youth culture um, in the gay community. Is there judgment in the gay community with um, adults who come out later in life? Uh, some of the most hostile criticisms I've had about that are from younger gay people who um, really uh, have confronted me and said, you had to know, you, 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 you're lying about this. Uh, it's not possible that you wouldn't have known. And it has been at times uh, somewhat painful. But, you know, I, in writing the book, part of what I wanted to do was to go back and uh, understand my history of how I grew up and how all of those things contributed to the fact that I was able to seal this off for so long. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. I'm speaking with Dr. Lauren Olson, author of Finally Out, Letting Go of Living Straight. Dr. Olson is a psychiatrist who came out gay at 40 after being married to a woman and having kids. Coming up, we're going to continue our conversation about the factors behind why some adults come out later in life. And we'll hear from two Connecticut residents who identified as gay well into their adulthood. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Same-sex marriage may be legal in the U.S., but that certainly doesn't mean life as a gay man or woman is accepted in all communities. Is this why an adult may wait or not acknowledge his or her true sexual identity until after 40, in some cases, well after their 60s? This is one of many questions psychiatrist Dr. Lauren Olson examines in his book, Finally Out, Letting Go of Living Straight. He joins us today from the studios of WABE in Atlanta. At 40, Dr. Olson realized he was gay after being in a heterosexual relationship and raising a family. Has this been your experience? What was your reaction when a close friend or family member who lived as a straight man or woman finally came out of the closet? Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Now, joining the conversation are two Connecticut residents who are now in studio with me. Dave Knapp is a resident of Guilford, and David Zaker lives in New Haven. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Hi, Lucy. Thanks for having us. Hello. I'll start with Dave from Guilford. Uh, you're a longtime resident of Connecticut. You graduated from Wesleyan. Uh, you had a career in the Boy Scouts. You sold textbooks throughout New England. When did you realize you were gay? I came out to myself uh, around the age of 50 and uh, then uh, was terrified. <laughs> 
uh, and uh, didn't come out to my wife and publicly until I was 60 because I was afraid of losing everything that was important to me and having my whole life blow up. You said at 50 you realized you were gay and you were terrified. Tell us about that. Well, uh, it was certainly out of the out of the norm and everything that I had been brought up with as far as morals and ethics and my marriage vows and everything else that I not only lived but also preach. You know, I was a Sunday school teacher and active in the church and active in community organizations and also had spent 10 years as a professional Boy Scout executive and so forth. Um, so um, it was... Uh, uh, why would I mean and leading the the average middle class life, you know, uh, college graduate and uh, middle class uh, lifestyle and so forth, and active in uh, community organizations. Um, at this time, you went to see a counselor, and what did he tell you? Well, yes, I uh, uh, I, I I had a job where I was traveling all over New England selling phonics workbooks. Uh, which is not very intellectually challenging, <laughs> needless to say. Uh, and I spent a lot of time in Boston uh, because the Boston schools used my uh, phonics workbooks. And I started to visit gay bars there uh, in Baz, and I couldn't believe that I was doing this. Um, and because I was uh, chairman of the Parents Committee at Daniel Hand High School, I was running for the Board of Education, uh, later in the Methodist Church, and it was these opposite sides of my life were just bizarre and scary, and I thought I was having a nervous breakdown. So anyway, I found out that uh, Canon Jones, who was the Episcopal Church in Hartford, uh, had been des designated by the Council of Churches to, to counsel gay married men and women. So I called them, and they said, come, uh, come up and see me. So I unburdened my soul, and at the end of telling him my, uh, all my uh, feelings and everything, he said, well, you're not the first person at age 50 to discover that you are gay and you might as well accept it and enjoy it. That's it, no need to come back. And I thought he was absolutely crazy. This was 1978, and I didn't know anything about homosexuality at all. Uh, and, but on a gut level, I felt he was telling me the truth. So that was the beginning of my journey for 10 years. You said that you were worried about risking it all when your family found out what happened. Well, I, I didn't come out to my family. My kids had go, long gone, but, uh, uh, but then at around age 60, uh, I realized that her parents and my parents had both lived, well, our, our marriage had fallen apart, uh, and, was, uh, and that was a serious problem, our relationship. And uh, so I realized that her parents and my parents had both lived into their 90s for the most part. And was it worth living in a miserable, unhappy marriage? Actually, we had already agreed to get divorced. Um, and uh, so I figured that, well, it was not worth living in an unhappy marriage. It wasn't fair to her, and it wasn't fair to me, because I wanted to lead an openly gay life and also give her the chance to do that. So I came out to her, and she said, well, that explains some things. And uh, we stayed friends. And uh, she, uh, five years later, remarried for the, thir for the third time. And that was a very happy, successful marriage. And I was very happy for her. And you said that she said, well, that explains things. So she had an inkling? No. Uh, no, she didn't. In fact, when we got married, she said, you're a better lover than my first husband. <laughs> and uh, so, <laughs> so anyway, no, she didn't uh, have... Uh, uh, well, well our, our sexual relation had uh, fallen apart also. I mean, that affected uh, when, uh, because of our marriage relationship. Also in the studio with us is David Zaker, a New Haven resident. Tell us a little bit about your story. Well, Lucy, it's kind of interesting because, you know, mine, it wasn't uh, so much like, wa well, there was a watershed moment, obviously, uh, and that happened in April of 2007. Uh, but, you know, sort of growing up, it's like I was always very much attracted to women, girls, you know, uh, and it was, you know, around puberty that I kind of looked over at the guys in gym class, and I'm like, huh, those are kind of interesting. Um, but it was just sort of the accepted kind of norm that, you know, you were attracted to girls, and, and you know, so I dated within that, um, you know, kind of uh, late bloomer, I guess you could say. Um, 
I met my wife. We worked together initially. Uh, great friends. Uh, and then uh, we became roommates. She needed a place to live, and just you know, kind of one thing sort of progressed to the other. But it started with a really sol- solid friendship. And uh, but for me, it was interesting. Uh, I got married in two thousand three, <clears throat> and um, it was probably uh, so. I had turned forty, and we found out we were going to have a child, right? And so five years into the marriage, suddenly I was thinking, okay, uh, you know, I think I'm gay, you know, and and I'm looking for ways to kind of like back out. <clears throat> And then we're pregnant. <laughs> and so you know, when you have a child, when you're pregnant, there's just, it takes on a life of its own, obviously. And those first couple of years are really, you know, no sleep. You're, you're living your life for, for, you know, this, this little baby, and it's awesome. Uh, but it was when he actually started to sort of put words together, everything's a question for a child. Um, everything has a question mark at the end of it. Mama, papa, doggy, everything's a question. And as I saw these questions, it was watershed that this child might have a question about himself someday that I can't honestly answer him unless I can honestly be who I am. And, uh, you know, I felt I owed it to my wife to sit down and actually tell her. I mean, it had been probably six months of zombie time. Uh, you know, it was uh, just, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, our, we had been going to therapy. Um, this obviously was a, a great uh, deal of, of why um, I was having so much difficulty. But she actually just one day looked at me and she says, what is going on with you? And it was a Saturday morning and I looked at her and I looked out the window and I said, I'm gay. And we both started crying. She gave me a big hug. Um, she said, you know, we'll get through this. And, um, and then we went shopping at Whole Foods. I mean, it was just, it was, it was this really kind of surreal moment. Um, I realized acutely, and still do to this moment, that as I was alighting from the branch to this sort of new life and finally coming out in that release that Lauren had talked about, that branch was now hitting someone on the head on the way down. And I knew it. And I still feel that acutely now, even though, uh, you know, years later, I mean, we are friends. We live in the same neighborhood. We co-parent our child. Um, I think my ex-wife likes my husband now more than she likes me. Uh, but it's great. We're, we're, we're all good friends. I want to take some calls. But before I do, I wanted to go back to our guest, Dr. Lauren Olson, um, who's joining us from WABE in Atlanta, author of Finally Out, Letting Go of Living Straight. Um, Dr. Olson, as you hear the stories of Dave and David, uh, you know, again, what what do you find that is similar to your story or, or the stories that people have told to you? And I'm curious about something that David said about um, growing up, he was attracted to girls, then he was attracted to boys, he ended up getting married. Is this something that people would then identify as being bisexual versus gay? Can you talk about that? Well, <clears throat> um, talking about bisexuality is a, a risky business, I think. Uh, you know, the a bisexual community is certainly advocating for a uh, separate identity right now. And uh, But let me just say this, and that is that there was a period of my uh, time when the only way I could really reference what was going on in my life was to consider myself bisexual. Yeah. Uh, and it, um, But it, it didn't stay there. And, and I think that there are people who are truly bisexual uh, and that continue to... Uh, uh, experience uh, sexual attraction to both men and women. That was not true for me. Uh, when I was a child or uh, an adolescent, uh, I um, had a certain, well, you know, when you're that age, you're sexual. You know, <laughs> it doesn't matter. You, you know, you're just so overwhelmed with sexual feelings uh, that they almost aren't directed in any particular direction. And but I always had a sense when I was uh, trying to date in high school and uh, I, and when I heard other boys talking about women's breasts and stuff, uh, that somehow what they were talking about just wasn't quite there for me. And I couldn't really understand that. Uh, and uh, so as the, your other two guests were talking about, I, I was shaking my head and I was laughing and I had tears in my eyes a couple times. So I think we've uh, had all, uh, we all know that feeling of living uh, a life which isn't right within ourselves and how uh, awful that feeling is. And yet, and at times, we don't even know how to explain it, uh, th- that we have that feeling. 
Uh, and the risk for uh, men who are uh, gay uh, is about three times uh, the risk of suicide is about three times the, the rest of the population. And a lot of it has to do with the period of coming out. Uh, and just is feeling that there's no hope because either thing you're going to choose, you're either going to stay in a marriage which uh, uh, is unsatisfying in many ways or you're going to leave and you're going to leave a life uh, that uh, you thought was going to be the right one for you. And so there doesn't look to the, be a good option, and that's when I think people begin to think about suicide as an option. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today we're talking with adults who come out as gay well into adulthood. Uh, Kingsley is calling from Norwich with a with a question. Kingsley, you're on the show. Hi, Lucy. Nice show. How are you this morning? I'm well. How are you? Yes, my question to Dr. Lucy was, um, uh, was there any time in the course of your marriage that um, uh, it, comes, or it comes to you that it might be deceitful on your part not to tell your partner that you are gay? Uh, the second question is, um, uh, what was the case reaction when they knew that um, you are gay? What was their reaction? Thank you. Thank you, Kingsley. So, Dr. Olson, um, he's asking about um, the feeling of deceit um, that you kept this from your wife, and then again, your your children's reaction to this. Well, the first uh, thing I would say is that you know uh, I didn't um, see it really as deceiving her about my sexuality. I saw her. I mean, I saw myself as deceiving her about the affair, you know, and I don't think that was a whole lot different than if it had been with a woman, uh, because it was against my uh, principles and my moral values to be even doing it, whatever the sex of the other person was. So uh, there was a certain amount of guilt about that and uh, some feelings of deception. Um, but I still hadn't really integrated into my thinking that my identity was gay uh, altogether. Um, you know, in terms of my kids, uh, you know, they, uh, they uh, I think, uh, accepted in a different way because they'd had more experience with uh, uh, the idea that people live gay lives. And uh, so they... They accepted it better than I, I would have thought. Even my grandchildren, you know, I remember once uh, my two young granddaughters uh, talking uh, in our home and saying, you know, I didn't know two men slept together. But that was kind of the extent of their questions about it. Um, uh, but I uh, have never deceived them. Uh, uh, and I really didn't feel like I was deceiving my kids at the time either. It, it, it's an odd thing to look back on, but uh, it was so new to me, so fresh, and uh, I, I really didn't feel like I was um, acting in any way. I want to turn back to Dave Knapp, an in-studio guest who lives in Guilford. Dave, you had a different um, uh, experience when your children found out. Can you tell us about that? Yes. Um, my wife outed me. Uh, I didn't expect her. Well, she outed me to the Methodist Church, which kicked me out, <laughs> and also to my children and, and other friends. And so anyway, the oldest stepdaughter, I acquired two stepdaughters, by the way, when I got married, who were 11 and 13, and they were wonderful kids, and I had a good relationship with them. And then we had a daughter of our own, so I ended up with three daughters. Anyway, the oldest uh, stepdaughter and her husband and now her grown children, one boy and one girl, who are married with kids, uh, accept me and love me, and I treasure that very much. Uh, the second stepdaughter, uh, who's a mental health worker and therapist uh, in North Carolina, cut me off um, completely, and that hurt a lot uh, because we had a very good relationship, and I gave her a warm, loving home. I was a good stepfather, I think. And my own daughter is a, uh, is a very religious person, uh, and does not uh, accept uh, homosexuality uh, behavior or even being that way. And that's a very painful and difficult thing, particularly since I have two grandsons who are now 21 and 19, um, and I don't really have any relationship with them. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's a very painful thing. Um, when you look at your experience and the different the different reactions um, each of your family members had, do you feel like that's something that keeps people from from coming out from from, from disclosing their you know their true identity because they don't want to they don't want to lose 
that relationship? Oh, there's no question uh, that that is a major, major factor, uh, as well as as the reaction of, uh, of the people, uh, friends in my church and friends in, in, in the town and everything. And so, and, and if you're active in the community, the, the pressure to not come out is even greater. I mean, here I was running for the Board of Education with my picture in the New Haven Register and chairman of the Hand Parents Committee and lay leader, which is the highest position in the Methodist Church next to the minister. So uh, the, the shame and shock and disgrace and even losing my job, I, I probably would have lost my job at that time uh, selling textbooks if, they, if my boss had discovered that I was gay. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Wanted to take another call now. Uh, Patrick's been holding from Manchester. Patrick, you're on the show. Hey, thank you so much for having me on today. Um, I just want to thank you for this, um, having this discussion, and I want to um, just be able to share that um, I'm glad that Dr. Alston brought up the whole aspect of the suicide depression part because I was married for um, seven years, and I came out at 30. My daughter was two, and I was just in a lot of despair. And if it wasn't for the love of my wife who supported me through that, I don't think I would have survived it. So um, it's just wonderful when you can have the support to have people be able to live your truth, and um, it's so important to have that. Well, thank you, Patrick, for sharing a little bit of your story uh, with us. And, you know, Dr. Olson, you had mentioned earlier the burden and what that does to people uh, mentally when they, they can't disclose something that is really important to them, uh, this idea of you know, how it influences their mental health, uh, the risk of, of suicide. But can you talk also about um, some of the, the risky behaviors, too, that uh, people who are you know, um, experimenting, but they feel like they can't disclose what's really going on with them um, to people that they love. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, there are a number of people who uh, uh, lead hidden lives, and the uh, Centers uh, for Disease Control talk about uh, the category uh, called MSM, or men who have sex with men. And I, I like that term because uh, even though it's awkward, it, it describes behavior rather than identity. And there are lots and lots of men in that category for uh, a variety of reasons who have sex with men. And I presume it's true for women, too, but I don't know so much about that. But uh, oftentimes uh, uh, it's complicated because it's uh, hidden. It may be in risky environments. Um, people who have a lot of shame and guilt about it may use a lot of drugs or alcohol as a way of trying to ease their guilt. And then uh, that clouds their judgment about uh, being safe in their sexual activities. And uh, oftentimes they may get involved in sort of uh, uh, sexual activity that uh, is uh, high-risk behavior. And uh, and so there is a great deal of risk, I think, that goes along uh, with that kind of behavior. This is where we live. Again, I'm Lucy Nalpathangel. We're talking about adults who wait to come out as gay with Dr. Lauren Olson, author of Finally Out, Letting Go of Living Straight. Connecticut residents Dave Knapp and David Zaker are also here in studio. When we come back from the break, we'll hear from a woman who came out after being married, and we'll take your calls. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today we're talking with adults who come out of the closet well into their adulthood and with author Dr. Lauren Olson, who wrote the book Finally Out, Letting Go of Living Straight. And we wanted to get a female perspective on this conversation. Joining us now is Beth Bai. She's a West Hartford resident. Many of you know her as State Senator Beth Bai. Uh, welcome to the program. Hi, Lucy. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I understand that you also came out as gay later in life. Tell us about um, that journey. Sure. I mean, I, I think it was really interesting listening because this idea that people wait to come out, I think, is not necessarily always what happens. I know for me, um, I didn't have an awareness that I was gay until I fell in love uh, several years after being divorced, and it just shook me and surprised me. And uh, like many of the other um, panelists, I had young children, and I had a job in a Catholic institution, and so it was a really challenging time. When you made that uh, realization, um, you said it was very challenging. How did you how did you get through that? 
Well, I got through it with love because it was such a strong pull uh, with my current wife that I just couldn't not be with her. I just uh, really fell in love, and I realized that at 40 that I never really knew what love was until I met this person that just sort of shook my world um, and also got some good counseling through it all and a, a therapist that basically said you can't, you know, and even a Catholic nun that said God wants you to be happy and your kids will do as well as you do. Um, but certainly my family and friends were very concerned about the impact on my children and and like another caller as well i was in political office and um on the board of education so it was a, it was really a scary time and i think historically it was uh less accepted when you go back sure that many years hi beth it's david zaker how are you hi, uh, david. good good talking to you so you i think for me too it was definitely really good therapist and um i had met someone in yoga and uh who gave me the name of, of a therapist that he had uh, strongly recommended and he had used himself. And that was really watershed, I think, for me. Uh, she was very tough, and but she was, you know, recognized that, first of all, you know, my son was really, uh, you know, paramount and that, that uh, you know, doing things that were right for him. Uh, and, and initially when I first came out, I thought, okay, this is great. I'm going to be a single gay dad and I'm not going to be in a relationship and I'm, I'm going to sort of, you know, keep him safe. Uh, in doing that, and then um, uh, you know, through you know, obviously being out and about, um, you meet people, and uh, and so you're, you know, you're you kind of broaden your your horizon and your your sort of uh, cadre of friends and such. Um, but it's the support of them as well, because so many of them have been walking in my shoes, um, and and it's just you know, it very very helpful. Yeah. yeah. And David, you mentioned and uh, during your story earlier that your now ex wife was very yeah. supportive, and that that helped you. Yeah, it's you know, and this is just. She was she was great. She was great, you know, and recognizing, though, that her world was crashing down. Um, and that is really the collateral damage, the untold stories of, of those, you know, spouses that are sort of, you know, left in that in that situation. Um, and then, of course, you know, the process of divorce. It's just, you know, it, it's such a difficult. I mean, they make it really you know, kind of a, 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 an animosity sort of thing. It, it, it's a it's a it's a really difficult thing to kind of get through unto itself. And so you're trying to kind of parse some sort of a relationship with your child and as, as you know, ex-spouses and going through the process. Um, and it gets contentious. And I will say it was not, you know, all roses and, and, and you know, kittens, uh, you know, uh, directly after the divorce. But, um, but we've really both, you know, been... Um, uh, been absolutely there for our son, and and through this whole process, um, you know his his health and happiness were really paramount. So, and can I ask about finances? I'll I'll go back to uh, Senator Beth By. Um, again, you were also um, in a marriage, and then um, were divorced, and and fell in love again. Uh, but you were well into your adulthood, and so when you look back at um, you know your story, and you compare it to say a young person who may be coming out um, in their teens. Um, as an adult, you do have that stability um, yeah, that that right, gives right. you a little. Maybe does that give you a little more security? Uh, absolutely, I think. Um, and you have a confidence, and as you get into your early forties, you care less about what people think. I think um, it would have been very difficult for me if I'd fallen in love at a younger age. Um, I was. It was difficult because of the complications of the kids, but you are more secure. I did have a reputation as someone um, who was a good worker, if you will, and I, I think I had a reputation as a public servant that stood up for people, so I had that to lean on. But it really was difficult for those around me uh, to accept this big change. So it's still challenging, but you definitely have more of a foundation. And as I said, just being so in love and having someone sort of so spectacular in your life, so that is really a, a good anchor. Uh, Dave Knapp from Guilford, you do a lot of talking at, at local high schools. Tell me about what you hear from young people who um, are coming out as gay or are weighing that decision and what you think about when you look back at your life story and the difficulties of trying to decide uh, what it's going to be when I, when I come out. Well, it's really wonderful what's happened here in Connecticut. Uh, a group uh, called Stonewall Speakers got started back in 1987 when uh, uh, Richard Ryle was beaten to death by two students, and they were tried as adults and sentenced to uh, 40, 30 or 40 years in prison. And uh, the defense attorney said this is such a tragedy for everyone, and there needs to be education about the subject, particularly for high school students. 
So uh, the GLBT community started to speak at schools all over, and I joined that group when I retired from selling school textbooks. And, uh, for example, 25 years ago, uh, we had one gay-straight alliance at Staples High School in Westbrook with Dan Wog, fantastic guy. And uh, now almost every single high school, there's approximately 160 high schools, has a gay-straight alliance. And it's a non-issue now in Mm -hmm. most high schools. Uh, 25 years ago, it was very rare for any any students to be out, and I called on high school selling textbooks, so I I know this. uh, And now, almost every single high school has not only a gay-straight alliance, but gay gay GLBT students are out, and teachers are out. And uh, that uh, has uh, changed the whole atmosphere, and and, and I'm remarkable that's happened in 25 years, all done with volunteers, by the way, with some old speakers. I want to take a quick call. Grace from Trumbull is on the line. Grace, we have a couple minutes. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm. Thank you for taking my call, and I'm glad you're having this discussion. My experience is similar to many here, especially Senator By. One of the things that I wanted to just mention is, in my personal experience, I feel like um, I've transitioned. Um, so, you know, women, there is research that says more for women, I think, than men, that there's this idea of sexual fluidity, and I feel like in my marriage, I was straight, and then what happened was I fell in love with a whim- woman and realized that I had this sexual I- attraction and then later came out and now continue to identify as gay. And there's this idea that, you know, we're born this way, and um, which is fine for the vast majority of people who do feel that way and identify that way. But I think there is a num- there are a number of us who feel that this transition is possible, this idea of sexual fluidity, and I don't feel any less gay than someone who was born gay. And I, and I, that's just the only little piece I can add here, I guess, to the discussion that's been really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. I wanted to turn back to Dr. Lauren Olson, uh, author of Finally Out, Letting Go of of Living Straight. Can you talk quickly about uh, what uh, Grace was talking about, this idea of fluidity? Yes, I, I, I do think it comes up more commonly uh, with women than with men, and at least in my experience, I, I don't see a lot of um, men who uh, come out as gay and then uh, enter uh, relationships uh, with women again later. Um, but uh, I think, you know, in my uh, experience, I began to look at sex uh, and sexual identity as a spectrum, not as a spectrum, but as a, uh, a, a matrix, because there's so many, so many possible different uh, uh, ways of expressing sexuality. And uh, so for some people, uh, having a bisexual identity where they're comfortable with, with both uh, is certainly a valid uh, place, but there are so many other ways that it can be expressed. Uh, and I don't think it's as clearly, it's certainly not binary, and it's uh, uh, even for me a, a spectrum of uh, uh, completely homosexual to completely uh, uh, straight uh, doesn't work very well to explain a lot of the variations either. Um, we're almost out of time, but when you uh, look at the second edition of your book, Dr. Olson, who do you want this book to be read by? Well, uh, initially when I started writing it, I thought it would be for men uh, who were considering coming out. and. Uh, but uh, it's, I really think it has a broader audience. I think it has an audience for younger gay pe- uh, people who are trying to understand what life was like for us, so there's a historical component to it. Uh, but it, I think it also is for women, it's for therapists, it's for, for pastors, it's for family members who might have experienced this, and anybody who has an interest in diversity. Really interesting conversation with you and our guest, Dr. Lauren Olson, again, author of Finally Out, Letting Go of Living Straight. Thank you so much, Dr. Olson. Also, Dave Knapp from Guilford, David Zaker uh, from New Haven, and uh, Senator Beth Fye, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Thanks, Lucy. Lucy. Our show is produced by Jeff Tyson. Our technical producer is Kion Wolf. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Have a great weekend. <laughs>